Hallelujah. Let's open our Bibles, the book of John, 1st John chapter 4, 17. 1st John chapter 4, 17. Hallelujah. Let me begin this way. Our generation is hungry. Hallelujah. We want God. We really want God. Praise the Lord Jesus. We don't know any other way except God. We don't know any other source except God. We don't know any other understanding except God. We don't aspire for any greatness except God. We don't aspire for any increase except God. We don't aspire for any multiplication except God. There are certain people who have options. We don't have options. Hallelujah. There are certain people who have other ways. We don't have other ways. Our ways are God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to submit to you before I share whatever I'm supposed to be sharing. But when the Bible says that in the last days God shall cause a hunger and thirst, not of bread and water, or water, but of the word of God, always understand he causes the hunger and thirst. It's not that who do. He can use men as entities to do it, but the primary place of the hunger and thirst in the spirits of men in our generation is for the wild. The Bible says they'll go east, west, wherever they will go. Whatever they'll be doing, they'll be just hungry for one thing, the wild. Hallelujah. In the place when the hunger is there, it doesn't mean that men will not be preaching what? It means that men will be preaching what? But our generation is not hungry for what? It is hungry for the what? I can have opportunity to speak things that I've had by reason of how long I've walked with God or the places of experience that I've stumbled on enough to appeal to certain senses. But our generation is past that. We are hungry for the word. And because he is the one who caused that hunger in our spirits, there is a certain message we want to hear. We have been around long enough. Many people in this room represent a people who have been in church for so long. Don't be mistaken, all of these people that are here are not just born again yesterday. They were born again long ago. They have been in church. They have listened and had everything. But we're still hungry for something that eye has not seen. We're still hungry for something ear has not had. We're still hungry for something that has not entered the hearts of man. Hallelujah. And this disqualifies any level and place of how much the brain can retain. This is something that can only sit in the spirit of a man. Listen to me. Some of us have been in church for so long. There are things we have heard. There are things we have heard. But we're hungry for more. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For so many years I used to read John. First John, chapter 4, where I was reading, 17. And I always read, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he saw a win this world. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness on that day, for as he saw a win this world. And I always loved the line of, as he is, so are we. Until the Spirit of God started to minister to me the depth of this truth. Hallelujah. If the Bible says that God is love, he doesn't just love, he's love. He's the entity love. He's the sole definition of love. I can tell you, if you remove love there and put God, the scriptures would say, and herein is our God made perfect. Not because he's imperfect. Don't get me wrong here. Not because he's imperfect. So the Bible says, and herein is our love made perfect. Herein is our God made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is so are we in this world, he seems to say that the places of perfection are based on the places of habitation. You cannot find lame men in heaven. You can't find blind eyes in heaven. There are no dead men in heaven. There are no cancerous tumors in heaven. There is no HIV in heaven. It's just spirits of just men made perfect. You get where I'm coming from? But on the earth, they are lame men. On the earth, they are blind eyes. 
on the earth there are fallen men, on the earth there are disturbed men, on the earth there are this cancer, on the earth there is HIV, on the earth there are accidents, in the earth there are imperfections. When Jesus came on the earth, the Bible says he took on imperfection. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. When the Bible says that he took on imperfection, it means that he took on a certain nature that was not perfect. And the places that were imperfect are the places of limitation. Being a human being is a limitation. Because there are certain laws that are contrary to you. And you must obey and submit to them. For example, gravity. Because you're human, you, if you fly off a building, unless the angelics catch you, you fall down. Because those laws are bound against humanity. But if you are bad, you simply fly by reason of your nature. So being human also is a certain nature of imperfection. So in the Bible says that, and herein is our God made perfect, that we may have confidence on that day. For as he is, so are we in this world. He means to say that when the human spirit grows to a place by latency and the approvals of the spirit are positioning the Christian in a place where as God is, so are they. It means that they are not subject to anything in the earthly realm. Hallelujah. And that is the perfection of God. That is the perfection of God. For those of you who are parents, when your child fails, it doesn't matter how successful you are, you feel like you have failed. Not because you failed, but because your son failed. Now if you earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly father? When you fail, Jehovah God fails. When you do not function like you, Jehovah God feels held back to function like he should. Do you see how serious this is? So when the Bible says, and herein is our love made perfect, is our God made perfect, that we might have confidence on the day of judgment, for as he is, so are we in this world. Many people, when they talk about judgment, they think about the end time judgment. But let me tell you something. The judgments of God on the end time to the Christian are different from the judgments of God to a man that is not of God. The Bible says in the book of John that he shall judge of the world sin because they believe not on him. But when you come to the new creature, our communion and place of fellowship is not judged under sin. When the old man in the old dispensation used to come to reason, it was always, come now let us reason together, for even though your sins are as red as crimson, but next and I cleanse thee as white as snow. When the New Testament creature deals with God, they are not dealing on the basis of sin. They are dealing on the basis of relationship, imputed righteousness upon them. And when the two are now in the places of divine counsel, the provisions of communication are conversations from high places. So Paul says, for our conversations are, our conversations are in heaven. From whence we look, from whence we look, from whence we look for the Lord Jesus. It ain't mean that our Lord Jesus is absent there. He's talking of the depth of the seeking of the knowledge of Christ from where our conversations are. So when our places of counsel are clearly defined, the life of the creature in the New Testament ought to be different from the life of the creature that is not yet born again. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray you understand me before I go a bit deeper. Because I feel I'm, by the Spirit I must complicate a few things to make them understandable. Are we together? And so when our love is made perfect, that we might have confidence on the day of judgment, Jehovah God is not talking about the judgments of the sins. The issue of sins has still been dealt with by the cross of Calvary. That is why the Bible says that he that knew no sin, can we go there? He that knew no sin became sin, are you hearing me? That we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. He that knew no sin became Seen that we being dead unto sin might be made the righteousness of God. First Peter 124. Let's go. Give me something there. 224. Uh-huh. Listen. Who his own self bear? Listen. Our sins. I want to show a correlation here. In his own body on the tree, 
that we being dead and to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. I want to submit to you. The first experience of Corinthians says he became sin. Okay? He became sin. In the second account of Peter, the Bible says he bore our sin. How did he bear our sin? He bore our sins by becoming a sin. He needed one, to, he needed a representation of sin to bear sins. You see the business. He bore our sins by becoming sin. So when we go to the scriptures of the sin that so easily besets us, you better understand he's not talking about the sins that so easily beset us. I don't know if you understand where I'm coming from. They're not sins. It is this sin. That which is not done in faith is sin. It's not sins. It is sin, plural. The sin principle on the new creature is not responding to faith. The sin principle in the old creature is not responding to the law. Because the two correlations are law, faith. Law, faith. Listen, the Bible says in the book of Galatians, the law is not of faith. It's not of faith. You cannot say that I'm doing the law and I'm a faith person. No, 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 no. That's indifference. That's indifference. You cannot do the law, are you hearing me, and say that I'm also doing faith. The same man who say, oh, some people are under grace, perhaps we're still under the law, but we're still, no, no, no. The Bible says, the law, Galatians 3, 12, is not of faith. The law is not of faith. So, you cannot say that I'm a faith Christian and then say I'm also doing the law. Or, that I'm subject to the judgments of the law to position me in a place where I'm explaining the sin plural, according to the law. So if I'm in the faith ministry, my place can only be against sinning against the faith. Oh, Shele Maranda. Listen, I can only sin against faith, not against the law. Because the law is not of faith. And I'm not under the law if I'm under the spirit. So the Bible says, so if I'm under the spirit, I'm not under the law. Therefore, I don't sin against the law and sin against faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It doesn't say and by hearing the word of God, no. It says and hearing by the word. You are by the word, you start to hear. That's why it says in Revelation, and let him that has ear listen to the spirit. Yet he has spoken about the seven churches. You think that because he has prophesied about the seven churches, that's enough. But he says, I believe him here, but has ears hear what the spirit is saying. That means you're reading things that are befalling Pagamos, Sadis, Theatira, Laodicea, and all these seven churches. But there is a message behind those chatting. That it requires a man with certain ears to hear. When a man has the secondary place of hearing by the word, the ministration of faith begins. The biggest offense that I've seen in the body of Christ is not hearing by the word. Because that's the very spirit that throttles revelation in your spirit. The ministry of revelation is when you get by the word and say, in the beginning. For the moment you read, in the beginning, the spirit of the Lord starts to explain. That's his essence. He says that in the last days, I shall send out my Holy Ghost. He says, it's good for you that I may go. For he shall send you the counselor, the comforter, the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says, and he shall teach you all things. And remind you that which you have forgotten, because I go to the Father. He says that the anointing that you have received abideth in you. And the Bible says, and the same shall teach you to abide in him. When you understand the mystery of submission to the spirit that teaches, you realize why men cannot pray is because they have sinned against the faith. Why men don't seek God is because they've sinned against the faith. Now let me... Why men don't function in the miraculous is because they've sinned against the faith. How? How? He says, the essence of the anointing which you have received, let me help you understand, of him, abideth in you. And you need not that any man teach you to pray, to fast, to believe. And he says, that as the same anointing, the Bible says, 
teaches you all things. And the Bible says, and is truth, not true, truth. That is Christ now. And is no lie. And even as it has told you, ye shall abide in him. And that's when I realized that the places of men abiding in God is when the Spirit of God teaches them how to abide. And the reason why they don't abide is simple. They don't hear the teacher. There's a place where the closed doors of the heaven to men. There's a place where doors are closed to men. Listen, let me tell you. The heavens are open to any man who has understood the mystery of access. Because the mystery of access is underlying on one principle. The liberty of the spirit. It's the very place where the judgments begin. It's the very place where the judgments begin. That's why he says that we might have confidence and boldness on the day of judgment. We are not going to be judged because we stole money. No, because we are past stealing money. You get it? We're going to be judged because the Lord set us so free to have access. To whom much is given, much is required. We're going to be judged because God gave too much access to us by reason of the spirit of liberty that works in the inside of us. And he says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, what did he say you shall do? You shall bear much fruit. You shall bear much fruit. In and out of season. The Bible says you shall bear much fruit. Why? Because you abide in him. He abides in you. Okay, how do I do the abide of abiding? Very simple. Understand the teacher, which is the Holy Spirit. Because it's the place that opens the ears that you can never hear. Listen, the place that I'm communicating to you is just primary ministry. The second ministry is the place where the Holy Spirit starts to explain to you what is being ministered. If a man has that kind of ear, you realize that that man starts to increase in understanding. That man starts to increase in the glory. That man starts to increase in the understanding. That man starts to increase in mystery. That man starts to increase in miracles. That man starts to increase in revelation. That man starts to increase in vision. That man starts to increase in submission. Why? The word of God is starting to work in your spirit as you learn to abide. But you cannot abide except you learn the teacher. Because the teacher is the only one who can teach you to abide. And the teacher is the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost comes because he responds to the Word. When the Word is not there, he doesn't work in the beginning. The Spirit of the Lord was hovering upon the earth. But he was hovering without anybody speaking. And when the Lord says, let there be, the Holy Ghost executes. But this Word is the Word of faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Therefore, if I submit myself to the Word of God, and faith comes to my spirit, the Spirit teaches me. The Bible says, oh yeah, the deep things of God. The Amplified calls them the bottomless things. The place that makes me hungry. Not because God is deep, but because He's the bottomless. Not because I can't search out every mystery. But because every time I fall in one mystery, I find myself creeping another mystery. Oh, the depth of His riches, of His glory. Paul calls them the depth of His glory and wisdom that salvation now becomes a place of hunting the psalmist calls it a hunter like one who has found spoil he says i celebrate on the word of god like one who has stumbled on spoil because the spirit world is a place where the mysteries of christ are just arrayed before us the essence of the light in the inside of us is just to illuminate you understand that's why paul calls it and to make all men see to see what is the fellowship of the mystery. If indeed we can cause men to see or dispense ourselves in a place where we can see, then we see God. So when he says, for our conversations are in heaven, from whence we look for the Lord, listen, if, if my conversation in the heaven is in heaven, that means Jesus is lost. What is speaking of the looking into the depth of who God is, of looking into the heights, the length, the witness of his love and the Bible says and that you might be filled with all the fullness of God that's the essence of love it's the four dimensional lines of his love but the same four dimensional lines of his love are the same four dimensional levels of the spirit actually by width, length, height, length and all this I can preach to you from the first dimension of the spirit through the fourth dimension of the spirit I'll tell you the truth many Christians live in the plane of the first few in the second now the, I speak thus this first as 
the Lord has shown me. You need to believe me. Because let me tell you why. When Jesus is in the first dimension of the Spirit, you realize he's in the synagogues. He's arguing with men pertaining God. But there's a place where the Spirit cannot vindicate him. I know Jesus had sat upon blind eyes. But he was in a dimension that could not allow him to open the blind eyes. I know Jesus went to funerals. I am sure neighbors died. But at that age 30, you realize that Jesus was incapable of raising the dead man. Yet he was a hundred percent God and a hundred percent man. But because of the place of the first dimension, it doesn't matter how much zeal he had and hunger for the things of the spirit, he was limited by the level. Until one day the Bible speaks in the book of Luke. And the Bible says he was led by the what? The Spirit of God into the what? The wilderness. And the first things of our master are there. But the true first things of our master in the back end are actually called the testations of the sons of God. And every son of God will go through those testations. Now many people look at <laughs> The three trials and they say, ah, I think God was this. This was tempted. You know, I've even had ministers preach from this. But they don't preach from the angle of men who have even gone past that. But they think they do. Why? Because the law has eaten a better part of them. To never have any understanding except moral uprightness. Moral uprightness is wonderful. But I'll tell you, there are men in this world who are Muslims and they are morally upright. But that is not going to take them to heaven. And that is not going to vindicate their spirit. Are you with me? It's wonderful to be morally upright. But it must be a seal of the sign that he had while he was uncircumcised. I don't know that you, you understand what I mean. Good morals are supposed to follow us. They are not supposed to be the standard for us to look to. Why? The Bible says, now we look at Jesus. And the finish of our faith. And then in one of those stations of the spirit, the devil tells the guy, turn these stones into bread. <laughs> and they don't understand that the stones represent the law. And they don't understand that the bread is the message. Turn the law into your message. Because he knows that the law came by Moses and grace and truth came by Jesus. So he knows if Jesus can change his ministry from the grace and start preaching law. That's the greatest temptation. One of the greatest temptations. There are three. But that one is very clear. I usually don't talk about the two. Why? Because mature people can figure the two out. But that's very important. Hallelujah. The biggest temptation is that. And let me tell you something. It's not that the ministers of the gospel have not tested the powers of the ages to come. No. They just fall away for fear of persecution. That's what Paul says. He says, for they have refused to preach Christ and the grace. This is Paul. Because they fear persecution. That people. That's the place where we want to please men instead of pleasing God. I'll give an example. Paul says, why should I be judged by another man's conscience? He means to say, why should I waste my time to find myself approved in the eyes of a certain man instead of seeking a place of approval before God? But there are many men who seek to be approved before the consciences of men. For example, when that man is preaching grace and he sees people who think he's preaching sin, he will try to preach the law so that they understand that he's not... And we lost many. And I'll tell you, some are trying to come back, but they failed. Why? Because there was a time when it was the word necessary. 
you'll understand this in future. Peter is moving with Paul every time. He knows who Paul is. The first person he met, Paul met from the Antioch experience through Damascus was Peter. He says, I abed with Peter 15 days. I spent 15 days. The message version says, oh, what days they were. That means Paul with a grace is speaking to Peter the lawyer. And, and you see, but it was three days before I went up to Jerusalem to compare stories with Peter. I was there only 15 days. But what days there were? Why did he want to compare stories? He realized that there was something the Lord was ministering to him. Simple. The justification by faith and not of what. So he said, let me go and compare notes with Peter. They sit down with Peter. And as they start to speak with Peter, you realize Peter needs more days. Peter says, okay, stay with me so we understand. One day, two days, three days, four days, five days, ten, fifteen. He's trying to explain one point, and that's okay. That's okay. But I'm sure at one point, Peter has understood. That's why in Acts 15, 16 all through, when the Jews from Judea come criticizing these guys preaching the gospel through Galatia and Antioch when men were moved with envy because of the numbers. When these guys are summoned to Jerusalem as of to debate whether circumcision and circumcision with salvation suffices, you realize that the only two people supporting Paul are James and Peter. Why? Because those were the only two people he explained to. You hear Peter saying, oh, our brother Paul, our brother Paul. He says, you know the long suffering of our Lord. There is something they call the long suffering of our Lord. The patience of our Lord. Paul, our brother, he even threw it the other way. He speaks about those things. He speaks about those things. It's a piece. Can we get it here? Uh -huh, thank you. And there come the long suffering of our Lord Jesus, the salvation. Even as our beloved brother, are you saying Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. You see, Peter preaches a place where he realizes, oh, oh, I can't go any further than this. Paul preaches those things. Do you get it? Do you realize that at the place when they were criticizing them for preaching the grace, you realize the one thing Peter explained was, me one time when I was in the house of Cornelius, God filled these guys without a wax. Me, that's what I know. I can't add, but me, that's what I know. You realize that he even feared the council at Jerusalem. Before you know it, he could not preach to men he was called to. He could not preach to men he was called to. The Bible says, Paul tells you, and when James, Peter, and John, which were the pillars of the gospel, saw the grace given unto me to the uncircumcised, as it was given to them to the circumcised. The Bible says they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Peter knew that the anointing on him could change anybody in Jerusalem by preaching the grace. The grace of God given to him was to the second side. God called Peter to preach to the hard guy. That's why you never saw Jerusalem stone Peter once. Yet it stoned Paul. Why? Because he always went in the synagogues of the Jews. Assignment again. God has called you to the uncircumcised. What business do you have with the Jews? Oh, he says, I wish that I myself were a curse for my brethren, the Jews. He has a certain attachment to the group of the brethren to miss the bigger picture assignment. And that's how Christians are. That's how Christians are. They fear to associate with certain people because of the things they say. That's nonsense. It doesn't matter who they associate with you. Oh, you have assignment. That's important. Minister, you have an assignment. That's more important. Are you hearing me? We owe God an accountability. We owe him an accountability. God called you to the Jews, Peter. Preach to the Jews. Paul, God called you to the Gentiles. Preach to the Gentiles. And that is why if you go through all his journeys, the only group that persecuted and got him beaten were Jews. The Gentile church never beat Paul even once. So I want to submit to you, Paul opened his own war. On the contrary, also, on the other hand, the only people who beat Peter were Gentiles. He also opened his wall. Why? When he was in the council, I think every time he would preach the great and see how resentful they are, he looked for soft 
landing. He went to the comfort zone. Why? I have a certain open door in the house of Cornelia. He's Italian. That's why he died in Rome. I think when the shadows are healing and he's going through Italy, he realizes that there is more grace. He says, well, even though I'm called to the second side, let me preach to the second side. You get it? Why? Because maybe, just maybe, the Bible says these things were for written for your learning, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures, you might know exactly what to do. Hallelujah. And it's unhealthy compromise for the church to look on, not only in the grace message, but in the many spheres that we're looking on in our faces and we can't face them and say this is wrong. It is wrong for lame men to walk around the streets and we're doing nothing. It is wrong for Mulago to fill those people up and Christians are praising God and they're dancing around drinking holy oil. It is so wrong for deaf eyes and blind eyes and to bypass us and we're, all we're doing is just watching. Cannot happen. We are sinning against the faith. Some of you think sinning is when you lie to your brother. Listen, there's a sin of not doing in faith. And how much are you going to compromise to raise a standard of explaining your limitation? Because, you, listen, the gospel is not about being too smart. Trust me, the gospel is about power. But are we just going to watch another generation die by and we go that and that one also goes? Or are we going to stand and say, God, me, I'm ready? Listen. We will lose a few titles, that's okay. We'll lose a few friends, let them go. We stay with God, that's most important. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, he says, our brother Paul, he's the one who says those things of long suffering. In his wisdom, verse 16, you see how he says it. And also, in all his epistles, Speaking in them of these things which are some things that are to be understood. Which they which are unlearned and unstable rest that they do also with other scriptures and to their own destruction. Next verse. And he says, but grow in grace. You grow. You grow. And then he leaves it at that. He leaves it at that. I wish Peter preached the grace in Jerusalem. I just don't know what would happen and then asked the Holy Ghost why didn't he do it and he told me he refused to eat when the Lord told him kill and eat it, religion eh? he says not so my Lord I mean this is God telling you and the second time he says you shall could not call uncommon which the Lord had cleansed and Peter still says no Leviticus he's talking to the Lord the Lord has told him he has cleansed it, but he refuses. Let me tell you, when the law sits in a man, even if he tries to preach the grace, it still comes out. Why? Because it's a nature. It's not of faith. It's not of faith. It is not of faith. It is not of faith. It is not of faith. And there comes a time where a Christian makes up their mind and says, okay, now where am I going? Am I going to keep the comfort zones of appealing to certain men to prove me true? Or am I going to preach Christ? Let me tell you, we have the biggest meetings in city town because we made the decision years ago. Years ago. And we said we're not going to compromise on what the Bible says. Hallelujah. Very simple. Very simple. And trust me. Trust me. We will shake this world. Trust me. Trust me. We will shake this world. Why? Because that's what the gospel does. Hallelujah. Are you with me? So when the Bible says that we might have confidence on the day of judgment, He's not talking about judging you over sin, no. He's talking of the judgment that must be weighed on men who had liberty enough for access. Do you know how much you owe the Spirit because of what you carry? How long are we going to continue being politically right? You understand? If the Bible says that the Word of God is power mighty to save, <laughs> I don't know, some of you should become a bit crazy. 
you, you should become a little bit crazy. A little bit crazy. But many men, when they were tempted to stand stones to bread, they turned stones to bread. They turned stones to bread. They preached a stone on tablets of stone. The prophet says that the stone is heavy. So because the stone is heavy, they put burdens on the lives of men. Men are burdened. And the place of burdening is where men are killed for the later killers. And men are judged by the very things that are laws against them. So again, it's ten commandments, but if she committed adultery, the same stone is on them. So the church of Christ is no longer her mother. It's a place of criticism. Men standing on the pulpit to criticize who is this, who is eating that, who is doing that, who is doing this, who is doing this, who is doing that. Why? Because they chose to turn stones into bread. They had the anointing to turn stones into bread. And because he honors his servants, he still honored them with the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit is not given by works, it's given by faith. They believed. But how long are you going to be like that, Peter? How long are you going to walk with a man and then two days later you say, Ah, I don't know him. Why? Because you see the place of death. How long are you going to compromise between two places? Because you need to make a certain provision for you to look good before people. I don't know who I'm speaking to. I think I'm speaking to you. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, if that's the testation of the Spirit, do you realize that the Bible says he was led into the wilderness by the Holy Ghost? But the Bible says in James, God tempted no man with evil, and neither is he tempted with evil. So the Holy Spirit could not have taken Jesus to the devil. No. There was a bigger picture of how all things work together for good, and the devil had a part. And that is why when he passes the second and third, when Jesus comes back, the Bible says, he comes back in the power. In the power. He, he went led by the Holy Ghost. He comes back in the power. In the power. He was mantled now to the second dimension of the Spirit. He stands in front of the synagogue. And he says, so the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the good news to them that are poor, to bring this and that. And, that. and the Bible says, when he says, and to proclaim the year, the accepted the year of, of God. Isaiah says, and the impending judgment. The Bible says, Jesus there, shut the book. Because this business was not the impending judgment to men who had the acceptable year. And he says, and today, this. Now do you realize that the Bible says and they are all astonished. <laughs> there was a time he could go in the synagogue and <laughs> they were impressed. But now when he comes they are astonished. The Bible says. Hallelujah. At the words of Jesus. And he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all of them that were in the synagogues were fasted. Why? Because when he comes in the second dimension of the spirit, he's not just speaking no more words. There is something on his words. Next verse. Next verse. And they were astonished at his doctrine. For his words. <laughs> the Bible says, for his words. For his words. Was with power. When you enter the second dimension of the spirit, Every statement you say comes with something. I mean, any man can teach the same thing, but when you teach it, it's different. You can cut a thunder, separate the bone and marrow, expose the heart and thought for what they really are. You can speak a man's body up and goosebumps, vibrating. Why? Because it's deeper than the things coming out. The things you speak, they are word and they are spirit. He says, I shall pour my spirit on your seed. Look at 11, the seed. Is the word. He says, I shall pour my spirit on your word. When a man is in the second dimension of the spirit, he doesn't say you're going to be healed. No, he says you're healed. And when he says you're healed, every demon and spirit in hell knows 
that it comes with the power. Like they are astonished at the doctrine of Jesus. The demons in hell are also astonished. You don't just speak. You don't just speak. You can speak a man to lose appetite. You can speak a man to losing sleep. You can speak a man to losing everything he has to get what's on you. Why? Because you're second dimensional. From then on, the Bible says now the miraculous in Jesus' life starts. And that's all second dimension up to his last days on the earth. In fact, the third dimension takes you up to his death and resurrection. The resurrection life of Christ. Hey, the first place of his resurrection before he ascends in glory was third dimension. It wasn't even yet fourth dimension. Why? Because all them works were on the earth. But you see, because the Christian looks at it in first dimension, they cannot understand that the things that Jesus did on the earth in the first and second dimension of the spirit and the third were just places enough for men to account. John speaks of another account. The Bible says, which if the books were to be written, the Bible says they would fill this earth of the things Jesus both began to teach and do. He's trying to launch into the depth by Stephen the third dimension and look to the things that supersede time. Because his 33 years could not have really written books to fill the earth. But there is eternal years on Christ. That John beholds and says, oh, oh, and the books that this guy has written, and there are many, so many other things which Jesus did, and which they are, if they should be written, everyone, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. The world can't. That was not 33 years of Jesus. That was more. There were things John saw eternal. That's why when John is beginning, he says, in the beginning, what's the word? He didn't begin with, in the beginning, the earth was, no. He didn't speak from Moses. No, no, no. He, he begins on the level where he went past Moses' understanding of beginning. He went to, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Do you see where he is? And nothing was made, was made without him. Him was the light. And the light was the light. He shineth in darkness. Darkness comprehended him not. John the Baptist was a man. Blah, 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 blah. The white became flesh. He beheld his only glory. As the only truth. He starts to preach Jesus before the body. And that's when we realize that Jesus functioned in the fullness of all the dimensions of the spirit before he went to first dimensional. So I asked the Holy Ghost, why? To teach you how to get out. Before Jesus came, he was functioning in all the dimensions of the spirit. Why? Because the Bible says that he was given an anointing without measure. He speaketh the words of God. He's given an anointing without measure. The essence of the anointing without measure is not that you do multiple miracles everywhere only. The essence of the anointing without measure is to the level of your revelation. Let me tell you, your revelation equals your anointing. The anointing exposed to your spirit is the same level, the revelation. Why? Because he always carries the simple truth, teaching. He will teach you. So if a man doesn't know to preach, and that's why the giftings are good. They have their place. They're wonderful. But we must go past the gifts of the spirit. Because there's a place where prophecy will fail. And it says, where it be miracles, they shall cease. But it says, but love, God, never fails. And he says, and I have seen the end of all perfection, but the word of God still be... Listen, we want to take men past the age of miracle, past the age of signs, past the age of wonder, to the age God. Word, God, word, God, word, God, word, God, word, that the scriptures might be fulfilled before our very own eyes in Malachi. And they that sat, that feared the Lord, he says in Malachi, and they that feared the Lord. The Bible says, when they sat to speak, one to another. The Bible says the Lord did what? He hearkened. He says, then they that feared the Lord spake often. Give me the Amplified Bible that. He says, then those who feared the Lord talked often one to another. This is a place of fellowship. And the Lord listened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him of those who revered 
and worshipfully feared the name of the Lord and thought on his name. So you realize that the book of remembrance has two provisions. The place where men commune regarding the mystery, it's where men think on his name. There are meditations that are worth capturing in the earthly plane. Why? Because they are too beautiful to fall on the ground. The Bible says he does not stand out his word and it falls on the ground. No, no. It must come back. And it must achieve. The Bible says it must accomplish. It must prosper in the thing where he sends it. Are you hearing me? That the places of our fellowship are worth Jehovah God coming to listen. And my Bible says that a book of remembrance was written, meaning there were scribes. There were spiritual scribes. The angelic hosts were told, write this. And then that's when I asked the Holy Spirit, why a book of remembrance? And he told me, let me read it for you. Let me tell you why it's a book of remembrance. Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 22. Let me tell you why a book of remembrance has to be written. He says, whether Paul, now he's talking of the revelation of Paul. Whether Apollos, he's now talking about the revelation of Apollos. Or Kephas, now he's talking of the revelation that Peter had. All the world, all life, all death, all things present, all things to come are all yours. Rewind. All things to come. You own 2050. You own the things of 2050. The 2050 are subjected to you as the Lord of them in 2050. And he told me that's why the book of remembrance was written. Because the kingly anointing relating to remembrance can only be for the future. Mordecai did something in the past and one day the king said, bring my book of remembrance, read it. And that's when, that's the time when the book of remembrance comes. For Mordecai's sake, it is a point where the Lord sits the gallows that should have hung Mordecai and they turn to Haman. I don't know if you understand where I'm coming from. Now in the very principle, there are certain things that we are thinking now, that we are meditating now, that we are sharing now, but a sheer provision for the future in which we live. Not we shall live, no. We already live in the future. It's our present future. Why? Because we have an action from on high. The Bible says we know all things. I own 2020. I own 2030. Oh, if I should sleep before 2090, I own 3000. Why? Because the word that I carry is eternal. If my Lord could preach something and 2,000 years ago, it is still relevant to this generation. God wants to raise men who have a depth of eternal word enough to be relevant, even when they are long gone. That's the essence of, of Psalms. He says, for when I was young, you did your wonderful works and I displayed your wondrous works to the world. And he says, and now when I'm old and great, he says, forsake me not until I have shown your power to this generation. And he says, and to the generations to come. Now when you open the book of Psalms, David prayed that he would minister to you in 2014. Can't you make a prayer to be relevant to the child who will come up to your child, 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 child? Can't you ever dream of going past this border of this building? Can't you ever dream of, of moving past, past the people that see you now? Let me tell you, God wants to make us so relevant that even if it takes him 900 years to come, somebody will get my CD, somebody will dig my tape, somebody will get your song, somebody will dig your mystery, somebody will get your teaching, Somebody will get your prophecy. Somebody will copy your hymn. Somebody will copy your tongue. Somebody will need your prayer. Why? Because all things are ours, whether things present or things to come. So the things for the remembrance, when the writing, there are men who shall stumble in the spirit to read things men communed over. There are things men, men when they say, let me go in the spirit realm to read. When they go in the spirit realm to, to stumble on things, they'll stumble on things men communed or on things men meditated. And you ought to know 
And that's the place where now Paul speaks by permission. He says, and this I speak by permission. Why? Because it's another man's copyright. He says, and this I speak by permission. In other words, he has to go through the spirit of Paul to inquire and say, Paul, can I preach this? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. He knows the difference. When the words of Christ are spoken, the things, the Bible says he spoke of the parables of, of the things that were there. That he says he spoke of the things that existed before the foundation of the world. Those are commandments to the sons of God to minister. That's why he says teaching them and commanding them to do the things that I told you to do. For lo, I am with you until the end. There are things that by reason of the Spirit of Christ are commandment to us. But there are things that by reason of the mystery of this order are by permission. They are by permission because men stumble over. I tell you something. There are things that men are meditating now that men shall minister in the future. There are things we are preaching now and they are going to go in the loins of our children's children. And one time your child is going to speak things and they are going to tell them I preached the same thing years ago. Why? When the Lord happened and the book of remembrance was written, the men stumbled there. And that's when I realized that certain men will never minister to except taking them to a place where they can read for themselves. We might never lay hands to them. We might never teach except if we can give them enough God for them to stumble into the things where the teachings and divine purposes is made. I mean, if a man of the Old Testament could stumble in a meeting and say, whom shall we send? And that man says, send me, Lord. How much more you, who doesn't stumble in meetings anymore? Because now the Bible says that the temple veil has been rent into two. And the Bible says that now we have access into the Holy of Holies, where Jesus Christ, our forerunner, has gone in advance for us. You're not behind in any heavenly meeting now. No. You're always on time. You're always on time. Why? Because you shall not seek him on that mountain or this mountain. The day that seek him shall seek him in spirit and in truth. But the place of our provisions were already there. They were very simple. We have the mind of Christ. They were very simple. We are seated in Christ. In Christ. So how can Christ attend a meeting and we're not in? But if the Old Testament man by diligence, by just diligence, could stumble on those things, that was the hardest place that he could go. He was a hero in his time. But it should not be heroic for you to stumble in the heavenly conversation. It should be a fallen state for God to visit you. We are not seeking for visitations. No. We are in the grace of the indwelling spirit of God. He is now in us. And that was the mystery that was hid from the ages first and now revealed. Christ in us. The hope of glory. So when I hear men, oh, the Lord visited us, I say, God, I'm past that. You are in me. <laughs> Let me read you something. I'm finished. Hebrews 2, verse 1. He says, Therefore, we ought to give the more honest heed of the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them sleep. Next verse. For if the word spoken by angels, listen, by angels, not by God, was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received the just recompense of reward. They don't understand that now the Lord is comparing them to angelics. They think God is only warning them against an impending line of ma making the word. Listen, when he says, let we make the thing sleep, he's saying, if angels could decree something, and everything is executed in whom God doesn't dwell. No, to whom only God sends. How much more are you in whom Jehovah God dwells? Next verse. How shall we escape if we neglect the great salvation? This great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that had him. Give me the message version of that. He says, do you think we can risk neglecting this letter's message, this magnificent salvation? First of all, it was delivered in person by the master. Do you see how wonderful? Listen, if angels could do something and demonstrate and speak the word and it happened, Jesus knew that this word was too beautiful to be delivered through angels. 
he came himself. And he says, first of all, it was delivered in person by the master. And then accurately passed on to us by those who had it from him. Next verse. All the while, God was validating it with gifts through the Holy Spirit. Now, do you see why the gifts come? All sorts of signs, wonders, as he saw fit. Next verse. God didn't put angels in charge of this business of salvation. That we're dealing with here. He didn't put angels. Next verse. It says, it says in scripture, what is man and woman that how that you bother with them and why do you take a second look at their way? Next verse. You make them not quite as high as angels, bright with Eden's don't light. Next verse. They put you, then you put them, listen, in charge of your entire handcrafted world. When God put them in charge of everything, nothing was excluded. But we do not see it yet. Don't see everything as under human jurisdiction. But this is what we see. But we see Jesus. We see Jesus. Made not quite as high as angels and then, through the experience of death, crowned so much higher than any angel, with a glory bright with heaven. Don't lie. In that death by God's grace, he fully experienced the death in every person's place. Next verse. It makes good sense that the God who got everything started and keep everything going on now completes the work by making the salvation pioneer perfect through the suffering as he leads all these people to glory. Now you began from a place of glory. You began from a place of glory. We might not see everything as subject to human jurisdiction, but we see Jesus because there is nothing that failed him. There is nothing that failed him. He was the darling of heaven. He was the success, the hope of human nature. And he never failed. He never failed one beat. But the Bible says that he had submitted everything under. He, everything, the Bible says, handcrafted by him under the man. And he says, and nothing in this world was not subjected. Meaning that everything that you see now, has a backline disclaimer of obedience to you, whether you know it or not. Money should not you be your problem. Nothing should be your problem. For all things are yours. All things are yours. And you're Christ. And that's the beginning of the judgment of God. If you had all things. You see, many people read, oh, and the farmer gave one uh, six pences and ten pences and fifteen pences. You see, and that's just a parable of the kingdom. He didn't give you ten pences. He didn't give you six pences. He gave you the world. He gave you all things. He gave you all things. He, he gave you all things. What are you going to do? Are you just going to live a life of victimized mentality and failure and loss? and disadvantage or are you going to do something now i understand why creation grows now i understand why the bible says that the foundations of the world are out of course that means there is a certain shift and shaking of things that hold the world why because they are so disturbed you're not showing up you're not showing up these things are translating into wars corruption in our nation why because the church is nowhere there is still something underground telling us there is something you're not doing. We don't know why. But child sacrifice should not be here. Men should not be passing bills of men sleeping with them. It's just too stupid. What are you doing? And you know, all Christians, we are fighting each other instead. But the bigger picture is very simple. The foundations of the world are coming out of court. Why? It's yours, but you're doing nothing. Bam. And you lose it. Why? Because you're pointing pictures and pointing fingers at everyone instead of taking responsibility. Of everything that is happening the world is mine everything is mine everything is mine everything listen that's why we're going to start to look at everything we carry as tools of the gospel you're not going to look at it as a smartphone no it's a tool of the gospel it was supposed to be yours you're not going to look at it as a nice mercedes-benz no it's a tool of the gospel it had to be yours because men are now lost in the vanities. And they fail to behold Christ, which is the end of, of all things. But now we see Jesus. 
now see Jesus. What is it to the guy who came believing God for tuition? What is it to the woman who came believing God for a husband? What is it to that brother whose wife left? What is it to that woman whose husband is going to divorce her? What is it to that man whose ministry is failing? What is it to that man who is dying of disease? Very simple. You're suffering yourself with the things that are of less importance. Look unto Jesus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Just raise your hand and speak to the home of God. God help us. 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 the man God here who just pants after you. They're like a deer that panted for water. They, they want something. Not because they don't have it, but because they're uncomfortable if it's not manifest. If you walk through Paul, if you walk through people, if you walk through their portions, you will walk through us. We're ready. We're ready. We know the responsibility of all things being ours. the confidence we must have on that day of judgment that we fully utilize, we fully occupied, we fully function, we fully serve, we fully submitted, we fully related, we fully subordinated, we fully yielded. We fully hard. We fully open. Or as it is, so are we in this world. Amen. 
thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Somebody thank the Lord. For an evening well spent in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Where is faith? I want to pray for you. Come. This is the only person I want to pray for. I'm instructed. Thank you, Lord. Give the Lord a mighty hand of praise. 